Texas football is right around the corner. It's time to start looking at the upcoming season, so let's explore how all the new offensive weapons can bring Sark's scheme to life. Paul Wadlington, analyst at Inside Texas, stops by to preview the explosive Texas offense. He just dropped the best Texas football preview on the market, and all the five-star reviews agree. I look forward to its release every year, and you will too. The 2022 Longhorn Football Prospectus, thinking Texas football, is available on hard copy on Amazon, with e-versions available through Apple and Smashwords. Link in the description. And you know the drill by now. Stay up to date on everything Texas football over at InsideTexas.com. Join today. Now it's time to go through the offense position by position and see what the future holds. Without further ado, let's get into it. Paul, glad to have you on the channel. Let's start with quarterbacks. Hudson Card went through a tough season last year, but what are some of the things he does well and where does he need to improve to get his shot as the starter? Hudson Card is at his most comfortable in the hurry up spread formations that were his Lake Travis roots. He's very good at pre-snap recognition, getting the ball out quickly. He has great velocity in mid-range, great touch mid-range. He, he can fit the ball into small windows. He's got a good arm. He's got a live arm. He can throw it from different angles. Uh, obviously, he's got some athletic ability. He has the ability to scramble. I think where he can improve the most going into year three is poise when things aren't going his way. And then also, he really struggled with ball placement when he had to go to his second and third read, particularly when he had to throw deep outside the hashes. That was a consistent issue for Hudson Card last year. You did see him finally hit a big throw against West Virginia to Xavier Worthy. And just as things started to turn for him and he started to show some of the promise that he showed in that Louisiana debut, of course, he gets hurt and he misses the rest of the season. That's where Hudson Card stands going into 2022. If Texas plays fast and really favors hurry up spread formations, similar to his roots where he grew up in Austin, it really plays to Hudson Card's strengths. He's good at early pre-staff recognition, but when the reads get a little muddy, that's where he's shown that he can get shaken up a little bit and not necessarily be on his game. And then we have the freshman and Quinn Ewers battling for that starting spot as well. And what gives him the potential to be that elite quarterback? And also, what risks come with that play style, especially early on in his career? Quinn Ewers is a talented, natural thrower who can demonstrate great arm strength, great accuracy from a dizzying variety of arm angles. When they talk about arm talent, they're talking about Quinn Ewers. He's also underrated as an athlete. He's strong in the pocket. And he has great feel for the game. He sees the field. And he's not shy about taking a hit if he can exchange it for hitting a receiver 50 yards downfield on a line. Uh, I think he showed some of that ability in the spring game. Uh, he hit some really nice balls. And he threw several other balls where, frankly, the Texas Longhorn receivers did him no favors because they didn't run the route correctly. Otherwise, they would have he would have had a couple of other touchdowns in that scrimmage. There's some Brett Favre in Quinn Ewers for good and for bad. And you've got to live with some of the bad to get the good. He's going to throw some WTF interceptions as a, as a freshman, also because he likes to gamble. But also, you're going to see the downfield passing game open up with Quinn Ewers in ways that Texas fans did not see last year with Casey Thompson and Hudson Card. So what is Sark looking for in his starter then? And do you ride with that quarterback through thick and thin, of course, barring injury? Steve Sarkeesian boasts a well-deserved reputation as a quarterback guru and an offensive architect. He's looking for a guy who could be the conduit of the offense. Texas doesn't need Vince Young to go make a play. He just needs a quarterback to make the play that he's going to scheme up for that quarterback. So ultimately, the starting nod is going to go to the quarterback whose deficiencies can best be masked and who can distribute the ball accurately and on time to a awesome array of skill players. There's a question of whether you ride or die with the quarterback that you do select. Broadly speaking, the answer is yes. But if a quarterback completely defecates the bed, he's coming off the field and they're putting in the other guy. That's just, that's just the nature of football. That's how it's going to be. And I think it's not just, it's going to be process oriented, that decision. It's not going to be outcome oriented. If there's a couple of unlucky breaks, a defensive lineman tips a ball, a receiver does a volleyball set, and he gets two quick interceptions, that receive, that quarterback's not coming out of the game. That's not his fault. So I think the fans and I think the coaches need to be focused on the process and not just the results. I agree. It's about the whole picture when evaluating a quarterback. And then we have a more clear running back room. We know Bajan is a beast, but can you touch on what makes him special? And as he gets ready for the NFL, what parts of his game can he improve? Bijan Robinson has elite vision. He has elite feet, elite cutting ability. Uh, he moves like a 170-pound scat back. 
and he weighs 220 pounds. He runs with a lot more power than people think. Uh, he bounces, a lot of guys bounce off of him. And he has a terrific stiff arm. We've seen that many times. In addition, he's awesome out of the backfield, which is a great fit, not only for the Texas offense, but ultimately in the NFL. If he could improve on anything, it would be as a pass protector. Uh, you probably don't want him as a pass protector very often. You'd rather have him split out. You'd rather have him motion out and put pressure on the defense. But when he does have to stay in and pass protect, he hasn't been great in that regard. I don't think it's a lack of willingness or strength. I think it's just a lack of reps, and he's never really been asked to do it. So that is something he'll have to improve, not only for the University of Texas, but also his NFL draft stock. One thing he probably can improve, he cannot improve upon, that the NFL may ding him a little bit on, is he doesn't have an extra gear. Uh, he's not Jamal Charles, right? You can run him down. Uh, some of his runs are, are going to go for 50 that otherwise could have gone for 70. But at the end of the day, closing speed at the running back position, that is not the way that, you know, butter your bread. You do it with the ability to turn three yard runs into 20 yard runs. And that's what Bijan Robinson does as well as any running back in America. And then how do we best utilize Roshan Johnson? Because it's not just his skill. He brings a certain spark to the game whenever he's on the field. Yeah, Roshan Johnson has the misfortune to play with Bijan Robinson because Roshan would be the starting running back at more than half of the FBS schools in America and most of the schools in the Big 12. And if he wasn't the starter, he'd be the equal billing guy that, that alternates snaps and, and, and shares the carry load. The thing about Roshan is he's incredibly unselfish. And although he doesn't have any singular incredible trait, he's good at everything. He's a good pass catcher. He's a good blocker. He's got good power. He has good cutting ability. He's just a guy that you love. And of course, last year, he had the get on my back game against Kansas State. 31 carries, 179 yards, just completely carried the team to victory. He's fully capable of that. But the fact is, he's going to have a little bit more modest role obviously compared to Bijan. Question is, how much do you want to use him in, in dual back formations? And the answer is quite a bit. Texas is going to be very formationally diverse. Roshan is a very useful piece because he can split out. He can stay in and block. He can lead block for Bijan when he wants to. He is a very complete running back. And there's huge utility value in that, not only in Texas, but maybe in the future in the NFL. For sure. And where do you see Keelan fitting into the puzzle? Do we see an added role or emphasis for him this year? Everyone loves Keelan Robinson for his speed, for his dynamism, and frankly, for his unselfishness. He, he values being a special team star, and he got his hands on a bunch of punts last year. He's going to probably do it again with Jeff Banks drawing up some crazy schemes for him. The hard fact is that he plays in a very crowded backfield with Bijan Robinson and Roshan Johnson. So while Keelan Robinson is a very valued member of the team, the best way he can get on the field more is if he can improve his ability as a receiver, not only out of the backfield, but winding up in the slot. Uh, otherwise, I think he's going to be relegated to a backup role as a runner, and then also he'll have a, a primary and, and very important role as a special teamer. And now we have a formidable receiver room to match that running back room. And we know Xavier Worthy is a star, but do the added receivers lessen his targets or do those guys actually open him up for an even bigger season? The added wide receiver talent around Xavier Worthy is going to increase his opportunities, not decrease them. Xavier Worthy is going to be the focus of obviously the Texas offense, but also opposing defenses. But with the talent and ability that Texas added in the offseason, that's going to be a very difficult task. And also Steve Sarkeesian is a genius at moving guys around, uh, finding roles for them and figuring out how the defense is trying to cover them. So Xavier Worthy is going to get plenty of balls, plenty of attention from the Texas Longhorn offense. I expect him to build on a record-setting freshman year. Me too. And what does Isaiah Nayer bring to the offense that we've been lacking the past few years? Isaiah Nayer brings a X receiver, a true X receiver to the Longhorn offense. He's going to line up outside, and he is going to stress defenses both vertically and horizontally. He's also going to give Xavier Worthy and Jordan Whittington some breathing room inside. Nayor is a big guy. He has a great catch radius, and he excels at winning balls down the field. All the early reports from Texas are that Isaiah Nayor has exceeded every possible expectation, and they're expecting not just big things for him in the Big 12, but also in the league up above the Big 12, the NFL. Is this the year Whittington finally gets to shine in that slot receiver role for an entire season? We know Jordan Whittington can catch the ball, but we don't know is whether he can catch a break. He, we've been waiting for him to emerge and to break out for three years. He's been beset by injuries and bad luck. 
They were striking him even before he stepped on, on campus. Now that he's healthy, uh, he is showing a lot of talent and a lot of ability at the slot position. He's 205 pounds. He has great lateral quickness, and he's very difficult to get on the ground. He is going to be a great slot receiver for Texas, and he's going to have a lot of room to operate because teams are going to be worried about Mayor and uh, Worthy. Jordan Whittington could stay healthy. Everyone knock on wood. He is going to show out, and he's going to have a great season for the University of Texas. And those are the top three guys right now, but we've got some other interesting names. Tariq Milton transferred in. How does his skill set and experience benefit the team as a fifth-year player? Tariq Milton, the Iowa State Cyclone transfer, is a program guy with a ton of experience. He was brought in for two reasons, to act as a backup slot receiver to Jordan Whittington, and then also to be a savvy veteran potential number four receiver. He's a perfect fit for the make the smart read, run to easy space, make the catch scenario. Because Whittington, Nayor, and Worthy are going to be creating a lot of space and putting a lot of pressure on the defense. Now, the truth about Milton is that his best football was played as a freshman and a sophomore, and injuries have plagued him and degraded his athleticism over the years. The big question for Texas is, is he back? And will a lighter load help keep him preserved? There's really no way to know that until the pads start popping in the fall and uh, Texas starts playing football games. But This was a potentially great addition for the University of Texas, and Milton has a real opportunity to contribute for the Longhorns. Yeah, I think it was a smart pickup. And to add to that, we pulled Hall out of Alabama, and he's got some crazy potential. So how does he contribute in his first year at Texas? This is a guy who folks struggle not only to cover him, but also to say his name. He's an X factor. And any season prediction that you make about him is in the realm of possibility. He could be anything from the number two receiver at the University of Texas if he completely blossoms and buys into the the program and gets his head in the playbook. Or he could be, you know, a complimentary receiver who comes off the bench. But if you want to talk about the fat part of the bell curve, the Alabama transfer has the ability to be a man buster. If the other team is doing a lot of man coverage and Texas wants to go four wide and and test their ability to cover, he's going to be matched up on the weakest coverage guy out there on the field. And that should be a mismatch. Paul has a lot of potential, but anyone who pretends to know what he's going to contribute in 2022, I think they're just guessing at best. He's definitely one of the most intriguing players on the whole team. And we could have some pleasant surprises from Brennan Thompson, Troy O'Meary, Jaden Alexis, and Casey Kane as well. Out of those guys, who do you find the most interesting for our offense? I think the most intriguing wildcard possibilities are Brennan Thompson, the true freshman. He is a 10.2200 meter speed guy. And apparently, offseason reports are that he has good hands. When you have all those other threats at wide receiver, you have threats at tight end, you have threats out of the backfield catching the ball, a guy like Brendan Thompson could be forgotten. And uh, he might be a very interesting sort of screen and fly type of receiver. You're either throwing him a screen out in space and letting guys like Whittington and Nayor block for him, or you're just letting him run straight down the field on a streak and seeing if uh, you can steal an easy 60-yard touchdown. The other guy to consider that I think has interesting upside potential is someone that Texas Longhorn fans have almost forgotten. And that's a shame because Troy O'Meara came to Texas and was the talk of camp two years ago as a true freshman. He was the best receiver on the campus. And he was every bit of six foot three, 220 pounds, and showed a lot more speed and explosiveness than people had anticipated. Unfortunately, he blew out his knee. He fought back. He recovered. He blew out his knee again the following year, and he's had a couple of knee surgeries. The off-season word is that he is healed up. He's running a lot better. He looks a lot more comfortable. So we'll see once the pads come on if uh, Troy O'Meara is ready to remind Texas fans of what he was capable of just two years ago. And it's not just our receivers who can be a threat in the pass game this year. Our tight end receiving should improve as well. Where are you at with Jatavion Sanders and the addition of Jaleel Billingsley? Jatavion Sanders is the best and most complete potential tight end talent at Texas since Jermichael Finley back in 2007. Now that's pretty bold talk for a guy who hasn't caught a collegiate pass yet, but I think Sanders has that much ability. The great thing about Sanders is he's a much more complete tight end than people know. And he showed that in the spring game. He is a willing blocker and he is a versatile blocker. He showed the ability to block as an H-back leading up in the hole on effectively a halfback lead. Uh, He showed the ability to line up on the end with his hand on the ground and neutralize a defensive end or an edge player. And then he showed the ability to track down smalls as a split out wide receiver. In other words, he can go find safeties and put his big 250-pound body on them 
and they're not able to uh, matador him or run past him because he's got great feet. He's athletic himself. Jatavian Sanders is a really, really interesting player. And I would not be surprised if he's going to be an NFL player in a couple of years. Jaleel Billingsley is the transfer from the University of Alabama. Uh, Texas fans are familiar with him. If you've been watching Alabama Crimson Tide football, you saw Billingsley in some big games. You also saw Billingsley not in some big games, which is probably why he's at the University of Texas for his final season. The thing about Billingsley that I think casual fans need to appreciate is that he's a role player. He is a pure receiving tight end. He is a flex tight end. He weighs 219 pounds. He can't line up in the backfield as an H-back and lead up in the hole. He can't line up with his hand down at the end of the line of scrimmage and block a defensive end. He is a role player. And I think he's going to be opponent dependent. There's going to be some games that are going to be Jaleel Billingsley games where he's going to show out based on how the opponent plays defense. I also think there's going to be some other games where you're going to see Jatavian Sanders and Gunnar Helm as the two primary tight ends for the University of Texas. Yeah, and I'm feeling more comfortable with Sanders and Helm's blocking ability as well. I was kind of worried about that going into the year. And speaking of blocking, let's talk about the offensive line. What does the O-line have to do to improve significantly from last year? The Texas offensive line has a lot to prove coming into 2022. The main thing they can do to improve is show better unit cohesion better coordination and orchestration as an an entire unit, not just at the individual level. In addition, they need to have better pass protection. Straight up at the tackle position, Texas was deficient. In addition, they got to establish an identity in the running game. And that's where the coaches need to help them. Steve Sarkeesian and Kyle Flood, they need to find out what this offensive line does best and really let them rep that out in the running game. They showed some ability to run outside zone. They've got some running backs, certainly on campus, who excel at outside zone, particularly B. John Robinson. But Sark likes a little bit more varied running game, as does Kyle Flood. There's nothing wrong with that, but they do need to establish a run game identity. And if they can do so, that's going to help their pass blocking a little bit. At the end of the day, the offensive line for the University of Texas just needs to be adequate to unleash the potential skill talent that Texas has, because Texas has a markedly better group of skill players than they've had since, frankly, 2008. And I think folks remember what that offense looked like. Uh, And they didn't have a, a killer offensive line. They had an offensive line back in 2008 that was sufficient. And with that sufficient offensive line, Colt McCoy, Quan Cosby, Jordan Shipley lit up the Big 12. What Texas needs out of this group is adequacy. And if they can get that, I think the Texas offense can actually be dominant. I agree. And how many of the young guys end up in that starting rotation as the year progresses? In 2022, Texas went and signed what looks to be one of the best offensive line classes, not only in Texas history, but arguably in college football history. And when you look at these guys individually, you look at their film, uh, I kind of believe the hype and Texas fans should too. That said, starting freshman offensive linemen, particularly true freshman offensive linemen, not ideal no matter how talented they are. So the natural question is, how many of these guys are going to start right away at the University of Texas? I think the conservative answer is zero or one. And I think that's going to be Kelvin Banks at offensive tackle. By the end of the year, I think as many as two guys could be starting. I think the best thing for Texas would be actually if there are only zero or one that is a starter, because that tells you that some people stepped up, particularly Christian Jones, and that they also found an optimal role for Hayden Connor who's kind of going to be used as the jack of all trades. They're going to plug him in wherever they can get the greatest boost as a starter. So if Texas has good results from some of those returning starters, hey, you may not see any of those young freshmen start or just one of them. If you see multiple guys start early, Well, that doesn't bode well for the development of some of the returning sophomores, juniors, and seniors. No, it doesn't. And then zooming out to look at the whole offense, what gives them a real shot to kick some ass this season? The Texas Longhorn offense has the potential to go from good to dominant. And the reason is because of the elite level of skill players that the Texas offense is going to be able to get the ball in the hands of. You've got an incredible backfield. You've got a a wide receiver core, which I believe will be the best in the Big 12 and top 10 nationally. You've got an offensive line with the potential to be improved. Then finally, at the quarterback position, I think you have elevated skill sets. Uh, Hudson Card should be better coming into his third year at Texas. And then Quinn Ewers, of course, is a blank slate. You could project about whatever you want into him. And the fact is, 
if he shows composure, he demonstrates his consistent arm talent. He, he understands the offense. He understands how to distribute that ball out to all those skilled players, including tight ends, the likes of which Texas has not seen in 10 or 12 years. You have the potential for a dominant offense, not only in the passing game, but in the running game. You also have the potential for one of the most formationally diverse offenses in University of Texas history. Texas should be very comfortable going two tight end, going four wide, going two running backs. They can motion out all their running backs. All the running backs are past catching threats. You've got tight ends who can both block and catch in Gunnar Helm and Jatavian Sanders. You've got a sort of role player receiving threat tight end in Jaleel Billingsley. You've got a very explosive but also diverse skill set at wide receiver. This is one of the most potentially complete Texas offenses that we've seen in a long time. And it's really going to depend on that offensive line and the quarterback position coming together to the hopes of Texas fans. Great stuff, Paul. And it'll be fun to watch them this year. And you know I read your football preview every year. So please let the viewers know where they can pick that up and where to find your other articles. If you want the preview, there's three places you can go. If you want the e-versions, go to Apple. If you are a Kindle reader, go to Smashwords and do the MOBI format. Finally, if you want the paperback, you're old school, go to Amazon. You can order the paperback. Uh, it's 150 pages of the best Longhorn football preview on the market, in addition to being, frankly, the best Big 12 preview and the best Longhorn opponent preview. Every position, every unit, every player. Look it up and read the reviews. And don't just look at the stars. Right now, it's all five stars. But go actually read the reviews and see what they say about the preview. If it's up your alley, jump in. I'd be glad to have you as a reader. And then if you want to read me and be a part of the best conversation about Longhorn sports that you can find, I want you to go to Inside Texas. And in fact, if you buy the preview, you're going to find a special Easter egg. And it's a promo code that you can use to get $50 off for your first year off as a new subscriber. That's 50% off. So basically, you can get the best Texas football preview on the market. You can get a promo code that saves you 50 bucks and your knowledge of Longhorn football and all sports has grown significantly. I thank all of you for being readers and I'll see you on the other side. And that's a wrap on Paul Wadlington. Make sure to pick up your copy of Thinking Texas Football, link in the description. We also have a defensive preview headed your way in a few days as well. Thanks for hanging out. Watch some more of my videos here. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and share if you want to support quality Texas content. As always, book on.